Today is May 28, 2013. We are interviewing Louis, or Louis, Brunmeyer. Okay. Benemeyer. Benemeyer. At Effingham DAV in Effingham, Illinois. My name is Cheryl Walker. I am with the Illinois State Library. Um, Mr. Ben Meyer mm -hmm. was born May 26, 1940. Mr. Ben Meyer, can you state for the record what branch of service you were in? The Army. Okay, and your highest rank was? PFC. And what were your service dates? I was in from uh, 1960 to 1962. Okay, and did you enlist? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, could you tell us where you took your basic training? Well, I started out at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, and I was in there approximately about three weeks, and then they shipped us to uh, Fort Hood, Texas. And I completed my basic training there, uh, which is standard approximately about uh, eight weeks of that. And then uh, after that, they sent me to Fort Sam Houston, Texas, uh, for medical training, which was another basically eight weeks. So I think we're in about May or something like that, 1960. And then uh, we got out of, uh, graduated from medical training. And uh, they said there was uh, 400 was in our class. 200 was going to go to Germany. 100 was going to stay in the States, and 100 was going to go in Korea. And you could volunteer to go for where you wanted to go. Well, I was single, no responsibilities, and I wanted to go to Germany. And I volunteered, and I got my wish. And I think I li arrived in Germany somewhere in June of 1960, somewhere along there. It's been about 50-some years ago. <laughs> and uh, from there, I went to a... Uh, Outfit called the 32nd Surgical Hospital, Mobile Army, uh, which we all see it now as what the MASH is on television. And I spent my, uh, I was supposed to stay over there for two years, in which I did. But in this whole process, the uh, Berlin Wall went up when I was over there. And uh, we got extended another six months over there because of that. And uh, through my term of... Uh, experiences. Uh, I've done a lot of uh, sports. I was involved with a lot of uh, softball and uh, also a lot of basketball. I got to do a lot of that. And in my training as a medic, we would uh, do a lot of uh, field work. And then uh, every three months, ever so often, they'd send us back into uh, uh, Garrison, which is back to post. We'd have to work at a hospital. And I ended up doing that about uh, two different times in different phases of the hospital work. Um, I don't know I'm about to, about lost now for what I've done, but um, nothing ever happened over there. That uh, when I was over there, I mean, it's just uh, pretty pretty calm. Did how come they to sent you? in the middle of your basic training from Fort Leonard Wood to Texas? Uh, after I completed my basic training. Then I went to Texas oh. for the second See, In the military, you go through your basic training. And then from there, you go to your training of whatever you're going to be. Uh, so you got uh, eight weeks of basic training. And then you have to graduate from that. Then you go to, uh, whether it's medical or you just talked about something, nuclear, uh, tanks, infantry, and that's your second eight they called in. And that's where I went to Fort Sam Houston for my second eight. What, uh, in your, um, so that would be your AIT yeah. training. Okay, in your advanced training, <clears throat> and you were in the surgical, or the medics, mm -hmm. what all did you learn? Or what kind of training did you have to do? Well, the basics of, uh, survival, uh, if and ever you went to combat, what you should do, you know, you stop the bleeding, uh, broken bones, fix them, splinter them, do as much as you possibly could. Uh, 
get them to a doctor as fast as you possibly can or to the uh, the medical side of it that was um, authorized to do all that stuff or more knowledgeable um, basic things um, you know if you had to give them a respiratory or anything like that you uh, knew what they had to do you know make sure their teeth were out and things of that nature uh, just just the basics of, uh, of first medical treatment for survival for them. When you were in Germany, <clears throat> did you, um, and you were assigned to a mass unit, did you have troops flying in from combat areas? Or? No. 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 We, uh, that was at the infant stages of Vietnam. Vietnam was going on and France was doing the fighting over there and we uh, with Kennedy at that particular time was our president and he was we was uh, relieving France and Kennedy was taking our troops and start training them for Vietnam and that was uh, about the time that I was getting out in 1962 but as far as the training and things of that nature of having uh, live casualties no we had a thing called patient play, which we'd be out in the, out in the field, on, and we call them the boonies, out in the field training. Uh, they would have planes fly in, drop uh, bags of uh, flour on our tents, you know, and that was supposed to be bombs, things of that nature. And they'd also have casualties coming in. They'd have uh, different people, you know, dressed up with different things, and you'd have to go over there and give a, a quick assumption what's the matter with them, move them on, and... Uh, Things of that nature. So you were constantly in training. Yes. We weren't in training. We if we'd be in garrison and we'd have uh, classes, things of that nature about uh, our our jobs. When you were not in training and you were working. Were there, were you helping out with like surgeries or? No, no, never did get into surgeries. In hospitals, I got into, of all things, uh, uh, it's called a CMS, it's a Central Material Control. And uh, that was, uh, well, that's back in the day where you had to clean the needles and wash the gloves and all them things, and then you put them in an autoclave. And that was the type of uh, thing I worked in one time for three months. And then the other three months, I got into uh, working into a ward, which of all things was uh, for babies and big you know, uh, just, uh, and, and, you know, taking care of kids like that. I mean, it was, uh, oh, I don't know what to say, really. It's just uh, three months of that. And then I, I did do some uh, sports over there, too, and I got TDY to go play basketball and, and softball over there. But, you know, when when you think of a mass unit, you you relate it more to TV mash, mm -hmm. and you think of being out in the field. You don't really think of a hospital and, and you know a ward that's going to be have children and babies, and well, but those were families. Yeah, that but were see, that was there. in the hospital where you worked that out. That's mm -hmm. when we was in garrison. That's when we was in. Uh -huh. Okay, in, in post. Uh, uh -huh. But uh, as far as thinking about that stuff, no, you never had that when you was out in the field. You had casualties of, of GIs that was supposed to have been injured some way, somehow. Uh, and I mean, they, they assumed a lot of different things, you know, maybe they'd have an arm blowed off or something like that. And then they'd bring them in. Uh, and everybody was assigned different things. You know, if a helicopter come in, you went out there on one end of a litter and don't make no difference whether you was a doctor or who, you carried it in. And uh, they had two different divisions of that, which you got still the same thing in hospitals today, called pre-op and post-op. And of course, pre-op prepared them for everything. And in that pre-op, they'd done the surgeries and do what they had to do. Well, then after the, after the preparation's all done, they put them in post-operative care and, uh, then you had to do that stuff, whether it's change of bandage or do what you had to do. And 
evaluate them, or the doctors evaluate them. If they can move them out, you move them out to where they can get back into a, a permanent hospital. So, you said you know it was back in the days when you had to autoclave, sanitize mm -hmm. um, the needles, mm -hmm. and you know a lot of people will think. Oh, they use needles again and again? Mm -hmm. But that was, they had, it wasn't disposable. And they were metal. Right. And you put the, they screwed in the needle. Mm -hmm. Right. And all those parts, you sanitize. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Right. Okay. You know, we'd even take the needles and take a piece of gauze and lay the gauze in your fingers, you know, and rub the top part of that needle. And if it did take any part of that gauze, you disposed of it. But then if it was still good, you recycled it again. And they had machines, they, uh, you could, uh, like you say, they take the needle, you know, and you could screw it on to the end, and you take an air pressure and push the blood and everything else that was still in there, if there wasn't anything in there. And then you'd soak them in some kind of sterilization uh, process, I don't know exactly what was all in there, some form of alcohol would kill all that stuff. And then you'd take them out, dry them, and you'd put them in an autoclave, and then you'd put the whole thing together, the needle and the syringe and everything, uh, to uh, autoclave it together, and then when the doctor come along the next time, they had a piece of tape on there, and then the, the tape would turn a certain color when you knew that it was sterile. Uh, and we've done that for gloves. We've done that for so many things. I mean, it uh, it is not like today. Did you, you seem so amused? Did <laughs> no, no, no. Um, <clears throat> did you live on base? Yes. In Germany. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What were the living? Were they barracks? Were they? It's um, it an old German concern that I was uh, living in, and uh, it was barracks. Uh, Majority of them were four man rooms. Uh, either there was a four man room or two man room, and we had two uh, two floors. Uh, all the conditions, you know, was uh, the showers and the uh, the baths were all on each floor. Uh, and there was oh, I'd say probably about uh, oh, I'd say probably about uh, twenty to twenty five on each floor. And of course, the married personnel had privilege of going to, uh, going home or live off base. Uh, if he was an E6 above, a listed man, a sergeant, of, uh, staff sergeant of E6, you had the privilege of living off base if you so desire, which uh, majority of the people didn't. They, uh, they, uh, they lived on post, and uh, money was so much different what it is now. We was. We was making, I was making, uh, I think it was clearing eighty nine dollars a month, and that was overseas pay, clothing allowance, and everything. And um, basically, it's twenty five dollars a week is about what it boiled down to. Uh, but you could buy cigarettes over there for a dollar a carton, you know. Uh, beer, if you partake in the beer, it was a nickel a beer, you know. Uh, things were cheap. Uh, it was. Uh, Basically, I mean, twenty-five dollars is not a lot of money, even even when things were cheap. But uh, anyway, we survived. Didn't make any money. Didn't send no money home. Another thing we had to do too, I, I can remember, was we had to buy war bonds. Every, uh, you know about this, do you? Uh, every payday when you walked through, we got paid cash, and when you'd walk out. Uh, your old man would be there, which was your company commander, and uh, you had to buy an eighteen dollar war bond. And uh, out of your twenty five dollars, out of our out of our money, out of our pay. <clears throat> but the, I mean, they was negotiable. Later on, I mean, you could negotiate or turn them back in for cash three months later, but you had to hold on to them for three months, and he was a he was a big World War II guy. Uh, he uh, thought that that's what we should do, and we did it, you know. 
Did everybody have to do that? Yes. Huh. Well, they didn't have to, but you had better do it, okay? I mean, it was not, uh, it was not an order to do it, but it was, uh, if you didn't, you may suffer some other consequences. It's not too nice, okay? You know, extra duties and things like that. And, now, did war bonds increase in value? Oh, they would, yeah. They would. But, you know, at, at, at a period of time, you didn't have a lot of money. So what you done every three months, you'd cash them things in. Uh, for your $18 is what it was. It's, it's a $25 war bonds what it was. But you uh, paid 18 for them. And... Uh, at maturity, you would have got 25 if you would have let them mature. And I don't remember what the maturity on them were, but uh, hmm. have you heard of any of this stuff before? Hmm. You haven't? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's been, you know, I was over there in 62, so if you put your pencil to that, that's 50 years ago. Well, I knew, I knew about that happening in World War II. I did not know about it happening still in the 60s. Mm -hmm. yeah. hmm. um, you said that you were over there when the Berlin War, uh, um, Wall went up. Mm -hmm. Did you actually see it going up? Yes, I did. And actually, I got the privilege of playing basketball within the wall. Uh, there was troops over there and uh, they had them inside uh, of the wall. That's when the Russians and the Americans were basically pretty well uh, talking to one another, you know. But the, the wall was basically, now this is just my opinion on this. I think that the reason why the wall went up is after the war with Russia, England, and the United States all forming that union, to defeat Germany, uh, they went in and it was offered, what do you want to do with this? The American says, take your country back over. The English says, take your country back over. But the Russians said, I want part of it. And I think that's why, because of my own opinion only, is Hitler promised that he would not invade Russia, but he did. And that kind of irritated them. And I think that's why that would all come about. It's only my opinion. Yeah, I've been to Checkpoint Charlie. I've seen that. Uh, very, very difficult when the wall went up. I mean, it was, uh, and I've seen it from basically about two different stages. i seen when the first part coming up, and then all the people were digging tunnels, running from one side to try to get out, you know, and then they put a big space in there, and they started shooting them. Well, then they put the second wall up back there, uh, uh, people were doing all kinds of things to get out, but and if you stop to think about it, it's kind of living. Uh, all right, let's say we're in Effingham County. We just put a big wall around Effingham County, and you can't get out. Well, think about that. Maybe you got a cousin. Maybe your husband. Maybe uh, one of your kids is on the other side. You know, I mean that uh, causes a lot of problems for East Berlin. And people were going back and forth, and all of a sudden this wall comes yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> did you, or were you able to do any traveling in Germany? Yes, I did. I saw quite a bit of Germany. I do the basketball and baseball, or softball program, baseball program too. Uh, but I went to Denmark. I went down to uh, Berchtesgarden or Bavaria, down to in the lower part, down by Austria. Um, I, I thought Germany was a beautiful, beautiful country. And uh, my last six months over there was getting pretty well slim because I was getting out. And then uh, I bought a POV, which is a private owned vehicle. And uh, uh, me and another guy from uh, Long Beach, California, Jack Fisher, we bought a car, $100, and uh, we would take other GIs out. Well, what they would do is they would buy the gas, you know, and they would buy our foods and our drinks and everything else. We just escorted. But we was riding around for and seeing a lot of the country. 
And every, every night, basically, after retreat, we'd go out and go someplace. We'd drive maybe 10, 15 miles out of way or whatever it was, just, just to see the country of Germany. Um, but I did get into Copenhagen, Denmark, and down through the um, Austria side, you know, down there in the Bavaria part. Were you able to buy anything sent home? Uh, no, uh, I didn't. <laughs> The only thing I brought back from Germany was, uh, well, I got a little statue of the mermaid there in Copenhagen uh, with the, the mermaid sitting on a rock, and I brought it back, oh, probably about, um, oh, five or six beer steins, uh, and I still have them beer steins. Uh, Wurzburg, where I was at, every year had it, they called it the Big Beer Fest, and uh, we was right along the Mine River. Spell with the M, not the Rhine. There's a Rhine and a Mine, okay. But we was with the right along the Mine, and right along that river was a big area, and they put big tents up there and they'd have a big uh, beer party. And it run for about three weeks. And they'd get bands up there, you know, and just, just everybody would have a good time. Uh, the Germans basically, 99% of them got along with the, the American troops over there. Uh, it's like anything else, you always got one or two bad eggs, it's going to cause a problem on both sides. But the overall picture, they got along real good, or we did in Wurzburg. And uh, we'd sit down there and drink beer, but, uh, and I bought uh, some Steins, beer Steins back from that. Uh, another thing Wurzburg would do, would they have a uh, thing called Fosching. You ever heard of Fosching? No. Yeah. It's a pre lenten deal. Like, uh, okay, you got Carnival in Rio de Janeiro, you got uh, down there in uh, New Orleans, you know, when they have all their big parades before Lent. Well, they do the same thing over there, and it's called Fosching, and they have before the pre uh, the pre Lent, and they have big wine fests and things like that. And then, of course, when Lent sets in, they all do their uh, fasting or whatever they do. So now, <clears throat> you being of German descent, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Back then, I don't know that it was, but nowadays, um, finding your ancestry is so big. Did you ever look where you thought your family? No, I didn't. That didn't mean that much to me then. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, that our, our family was pretty well, uh, it was a large family. Uh, my grandpa had about, uh, I think, six or seven brothers or something like that, and three or four sisters. They come from a big family, and the name of Benamar did spread around here. And now it's kind of, uh, oh, it's kind of depleted, you know, but uh, the, uh, that, that just didn't bother me. I had all kinds of family back home and just didn't seem of any interest. And not only that, but I just, I was basically a 19-year-old kid, okay? You, uh... As we grow older, we think a lot different what we do when we were young. A lot of different ways, too, you know. So, but that, that didn't interest me. It didn't whatsoever. I think now, too, now with the Internet and things like that, it's become different. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the mode of communication is different. See, the, <clears throat> the thing, a lot of things, too, you know, I mean, uh, I don't think the GI really got a good, Oh, fair shake of life and everything else. Uh, even in Vietnam and just still a lot of that stuff after World War II, a lot of people didn't like them, you know. Um, but, um, and that made a little bit of difference too, you know. I mean, uh, you didn't, like I say, we got along good over there, but you just didn't do anything out of line, you know. Did you, <clears throat> when you were off post, were you out of uniform? Were you in civilian? I wore civilian clothes, probably. Well, it didn't make any difference. Uh, I wore civilian clothes, I'd probably say 75% of the time. Mm -hmm. But we went through things called bed check. We had uh, bed check you had to be in by in bed at midnight. Lights out when it was at 10 o'clock, bed check at midnight. Uh, I had uh, wake up call at 5 o'clock. Uh, Six o'clock in the morning, you went out at Reveille. And Reveille, as you go out there, and I don't care whether it's raining, 
snow and he went out there and saluted the flag. And then at five o'clock, they had a thing called retreat, which they brought the flag down. And uh, you had to stand that. But we soldiered. When we was in, when we was in garrison, uh, when we was in uh, our, our concern, we soldiered. Mm -hmm. And pretty strict, you know. There was a lot of things you couldn't do. More discipline then than what there is now. That's. Um, <clears throat> so you enlisted, and what made you enlist? Well, several things. First of all, <clears throat> it was mandatory at that time that you had to go into service. Uh, so I knew that sooner or later it was going to happen, so I decided to get it over with. Uh, another thing, unemployment was very, very high at that particular time. Uh, and then basically were the two reasons on why I done it. And I was, I didn't, I, I had a, I had a job and uh, I had a car, which was nothing great or anything like that. And it was paid for, but uh, I had no particular avenue of life to pursue. So I thought, well, let's get her over with. Uh, that's what I done. Did <clears throat> When, okay, going back to, you had mentioned that you had a private-owned vehicle over mm -hmm. in Germany. Did you bring that vehicle back with you? No. No, it was just a piece of crap. <laughs> okay. At one point in time, didn't the military bring back private-owned vehicles? Yes. Um, a lot of them. There's a Volkswagen was a very popular car over there, and there was a guy by the name of Carmen Gia, which well, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, he was the first one to come out with these things. Well, you could buy these over there for something like eight hundred dollars, and uh, a lot of these GIs was just their parents had money. Well, they would buy the car for their kid, and uh, and as a veteran, they would ship it home for you for nothing. And uh, you'd get over here, and then same Carmen Gibbs was probably, you know, he's probably spending anywhere from fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars for him then. And uh, a lot of them kids were doing that, but that was the people with the money. Mm -hmm. So, and there was a lot of guys too that uh, uh, a lot of uh, they call them U.S.s, which was uh, draftees, but a lot of U.S.s uh, liked it over there too. Is when they got discharged. Uh, they bought a car, you know, like I say, a piece of junk, um, but they would tour, they'd just go all over, you know, and uh, <clears throat> just wherever they wanted to go, they would go, you know, uh, and you make friends over there. Uh, I know a lot of this stuff probably is, uh, I mean, if you'd have friends maybe in a different city or a different uh, town, uh, you'd slip in there at the billets, you know, and take a shower, and uh, you wasn't supposed to do it, but... Uh, a lot of that got done, you know, uh, which I didn't see anything wrong with it. I, but uh, probably it was verboten as far as the government was concerned. But uh, uh, and then things like that, and it's just they just uh, they liked it over there. I mean, it was a beautiful country, and uh, everything is so close over there in Germany. I mean, you can go. Uh, you take Germany and basically set the whole country of Germany in the state of Illinois and Indiana. That's, you know, the size of it. And so it's kind of like being over here. If you want to go to Austria, you want to go to Luxembourg, or where do you want to go? You just, you could be there basically in about two or three hundred miles, you know, to a different country. Have you ever been back there? No. But would I love to go? Yes, I would. I don't think I'll ever get it done. Uh, I just went through a health problem, uh, cancer. Took about two years out of my life, but um, I'm in remission now. So, um, 
I'm happy with that, you know, but uh, I, I, I just don't have the strength or endurance anymore. But would I like to go back? Yes, I would. I, uh, and I think that I could probably do it financially, too, you know. Uh, that, that wouldn't be a problem. It's just I don't think I'd have the strength to do it. And I don't know. I just don't like to travel either like I used to. Do you remember <clears throat> the date? The day that you were discharged. Yes, I do. Where were you? I was at Fort Hamilton in uh, New York. I uh, called one of my friends up uh, that lived in Patterson, New Jersey, and uh, called him up. And I said, Ed, I'm down here at the train station down here at uh, Grand Central Station in New York. Would you uh, want to come on down? We'll have a couple of soda pops. Beer. And uh, yeah, yeah. He said, well, that's about an hour drive. I'll be down. And he come down. And uh, so uh, in this whole sequence and everything, going out and having a couple of uh, beers, we uh, we decided, to, he says, why don't you stay over here and I'll show you the city. And uh, I uh, stayed at his house for roughly about a week. And uh, he turned all over. He just took me all over the uh, the city of New York. I've seen the Statue of Liberty. I don't know well, I've seen it going to Germany. It went over by boat. And uh, I've seen it probably 15, 20 times after. Uh, driving down oh, cities of New York, I mean, the, the lights and everything else, down Broadway, down the, I mean, it's just, it's absolutely beautiful. And so in return, better done. Is when I got home, I got established. I called Ed up and I said, Why don't you come on down to my house? You know, stay down here for about a week. And he did. Uh, I got another friend I went through the service with uh, from Washington, uh, Missouri. Uh, I've seen him probably you know, 10 times. Uh, we still we don't communicate real well, but we do get together every now and then. Uh, but um, Couple of my service buddies, and I see, and I, and I got off the track here about the talking, but I do remember the day I got discharged. I mean, that was uh, a, a day of very uncertainty. Again, uh, we're still going through that um, age of uh, unemployment. Uh, had no education. I didn't know what I was going to do with myself. Uh, even thought about uh, reenlisting. But that never did prevail, so. What did you do after the service? Uh, I got a job in uh, Joliet at Caterpillar. I worked there for about two years and uh, just hated the factory. So, and then there's this little girl, which, you know, they changed minds, not only for the male, but the female too, I understand that. But, so I kind of fell in love with this little girl and come back home. Got me a job, started at a bar at a restaurant. And uh, that never did prevail with the love with her. But as the uh, work at the restaurant uh, went on, I ended up uh, working for about five years. And the woman that owned it decided she wanted to get out. And so I bought it. And uh, put 38 years in that place and retired in uh, when I was 62 at uh, uh, 02. And I retired, sold it, and here I am. But it, it's a success story, really, it is for me. Uh, but like I say, life, life turned out so good for me in so many different ways. I end up with a uh, get married again, and I got two beautiful grandkids, and uh, uh, I, I'm just so happy that I never did relist, you know. Uh, yep. Life <clears throat> always takes you down the good path. I know, but it, it's kind of, you know, it's yeah. not a straight path, you know, it's a, and not only that, there's always a couple of bumps in it, too. Mm -hmm. But every, everything, like I say, everything has turned out absolutely wonderful for me. Yes, I've had some problems. Yes, uh, uh, health-wise, I mean, I took a big 
When they put that C word in front of you, I'll tell you what, that uh, scares the living dickens out of you. And, uh, but uh, here again, Uncle Sam took care of me, so he sent me over to Barnes Jewish Hospital, cut the stuff out, went through the whole chemotherapy and everything else. Uh, and now I, I've got uh, two more visits to go, and I think they're going to can me or get rid of me or probably put me on a one-year basis of uh, going back for checkups. So, and that turned out good. My marriage turned out good. We've been together almost 50 years or 40 years now. So, you know, it's a big, it's a big rosy picture for me. I know you don't want to hear this on the military side of it. Oh, no, that's, no, that's all part of it. And I thank you for sharing that. Is there anything else you'd like to tell me? Not that I can think of. I, uh, I don't know. I just, uh, it's, it's, uh, the only thing I can say about the military, it creates such a bond with your fellow man. You can meet a guy from... New York, or like Patterson, New Jersey, or California, or Washington, Missouri, I don't care. Uh, and he don't have to be white, he can be black, it don't make any difference. But you create such a, a, a bond within people. You become very close to him, just as close as what a brother is. Uh, but, um, and there's, there's, like I say, the, the military back in our day, I mean, they were strict. But yet they were good. And uh, that's probably the best, you know, I mean, uh, one of the best uh, educations I got, you know. Uh, better than going to school. But I mean, again, here, I turned out lucky on this. So. I think today is a different story. You got to have an education before you do anything. So. Well, Lou, I would like to um, take this opportunity to first thank you for the time that you gave to our country and the time that you gave in the service. Well, I didn't do much while I was in the service, but... You did. You did. Like I say, I answered the bell, okay? I, I'm no hero. Them guys over there that's got missing arms and purple hearts and things of like that, they're the heroes. I mean, they're the, they're the ones. Everyone that has served in the service is well, a hero. I, I Some are different heroes yeah, than well, others. I, I understand a lot of things because a lot of people don't understand there. You know, the first thing, we go out sometimes and talk to kids, you know, what it's like to be like in the military. And everybody thinks that you go in the Army, you go in the Marines, you're right in the front lines. Well, no. Very few, I mean, the majority of them get back, but the people that's in the front lines, they got to have a medic. they got to have somebody to drive them there to get uh, over some gas, some food, you know. they got to give them some ammunition. Then you got somebody back here that's got to do something else. Well, then there's a guy that's got to take care of the records. You know, I mean, they're in the service, they get paid. Well, then you're going to have finance, you know. There's so many different phases of that military that people don't understand. But it, it is a big unit to make, well, they're a world within their own world is what they are, a country within their own country. Okay, done preaching. you probably got other people on. I would like to also... Thank you for the time that you've given me today and the opportunity to. Oh, you've been a very sweet lady. Thank you. Okay.